Dr. Lewis. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. A news update on the case of Nadja Foster, a First Voice graduate and longtime unpaid staff member here at KPFA. Her trial for alleged trespassing within the radio station and alleged assault charges is coming up at the Oakland Courthouse, 661 Washington Street. The public is encouraged to attend. She won't know until the 20th the exact date of her trial, so make sure and check out blackreportradio.com for further information about the case. You're listening to KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, or KFCF in Fresno, or on the web at kpfa.org. It's 7 p.m. Up next, Full Circle. Stay with us. Full Circle, yes, we roll. Space. 360 degrees. High, high, 360 degrees. High, high, 306. 306. 360 degrees. High, high. What's up, folks? Welcome to Full Circle, community radio produced by members of the First Voice Media Action Program. On tonight's show, we'll talk about how to get ready for that thing you've been hearing about, the DTV transition. And we'll have our Oakland East Side story, Memories and Hopes for East Oakland. Also, homies organizing the mission to empower youth will join us, a.k.a. homie. They'll be talking with us about Pink Friday, which is today, and the impact of state budget cuts on youth and their upcoming event, Education or the Bullet. So keep it locked right here. KPFA 94.1. I'm your host, Ranjita G. I mean, Renee G. <laughs> To get us in the digital mood with a song called We Are the Future. And a lot of folks already know that the digital TV transition is coming up this summer. Some folks may have already have a satellite cable or a digital TV. But if you still have a TV with an antenna, you should listen up because the transition will affect you. And joining us to break it down for us is Tracy Rosenberg. She's the executive director of Media Alliance in Oakland. And also, listeners, if you have a question about the transfer that you want answered... Give us a call at 510-848-4425. We will try to answer your question about the digital TV transfer. That's 510-848-4425. And during our time here with Tracy, we'll try to give you as much information about this digital transition as we can. So thanks for coming on, Tracy. And we will turn your mic on. There we go, Tracy. Hi, Renee. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm happy you made it. So the original date for the DTV transition was February 17th, and now it's pushed back to June 12th because people in Congress feared that many people were not ready for the switch, 
and the federal coupon program actually ran out of money already. So do you think they were wise to push it back, and what's the status of the coupon program now? I think they feared that for a pretty good reason. One of the reasons was 4 million people on the coupon waiting list, and if you think about that number, that's a pretty freaky number. It's now gone down to 3 million people, so they're making progress, but that's still more than a few. So you guys opened up a DTV assistance center in downtown Oakland. Have you seen folks coming in, and what kind of questions do they have about the transfer? Yeah, we started agitating to open up an assistance center sort of on the ground and in the neighborhood where people really were literally like six to nine months ago, and nobody listened to any of that. And after they started backing up with millions of people in the coupon program and after the 1-800-DTV.gov phone number got backed up, then finally a little bit of money came trickling down from the federal government. It came through the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, which made a very tangible argument that access to information is a civil right. And if people's televisions are just going to black out on them, that's got really serious ramifications for people being able to participate equally in in society. So way back in December 2008, only two and a half months before the transition was originally scheduled, we and a couple of other groups in seven cities in the United States were able to open on the ground assistance centers. And those assistance centers have been getting calls and walk-ins and really constant business because people were nowhere near prepared. So folks aren't prepared. Who? What? Are, what? What populations are we talking about? Because a lot of folks I know have digital TVs already. They have satellite cable, and they get like 500 channels. Uh-huh. Are there really <laughs> folks out there who still have uh, bunny ears? Well, that's what we were told. We got a government census that said originally that 6% of the population was not prepared before this sort of on-the-ground assistance center project started. Now those numbers are looking to be about 3.6%. And just to make that real, in Alameda and Contra Costa counties, that's 86,400 people. That's the voice. Oh, sorry. Yeah, huge chunk Mm -hmm. of people. That's a lot of folks. So if you're out there and you have a question about the digital TV transfer, give us a call here at 510-848-4425 and we'll try to answer your question. Yeah, most of what we found is that the primary groups that compose this 86,400 people is the elderly, seniors, they're still watching television with their little rabbit ears like they have for the last 40 years, Um, people with disability concerns and mobility concerns who don't go shopping and update their television, limited English language speakers, Exactly all of the people who probably don't have significant access to heavy-duty broadband technology or other ways to get necessary information. So I think the construct that the digital TV um, transition is really part of a civil rights struggle that's about people participating equally in society is really a 100% accurate construction. It is. So is this, so when we talk about the digital divide and the people who are, potentially going to be left behind in this transfer. Talk about that more as a civil right and and the reality of of the access to information in the context of this transition. Well, I think people can tell now that so much of our political and civic dialogue really takes place on the Internet. I mean, if you're one of those people that's broadband at home and at work and the emails are kind of flying in, you may feel that it's more of a nuisance than anything else, but you receive up-to-date information on anything in the universe that you're interested in almost constantly. Now, imagine if you only had Internet access two hours a day, if you only had it at work. Uh, Imagine if you were sitting there on a dial-up, and every time something came in with a couple of megabytes, your computer collapsed. You really wouldn't have the same scope of information available to you. We've been looking, for example, at some of the stimulus package information that the Obama um, administration is putting forward. You know, part of that money is is to deal with, with some of these issues. But what's been becoming clear is that if you're not already plugged in, it's really hard to get the information about how to make that manifest. Um, you know, people that are really working in the community don't know how to get these funds. So there are some real challenges in terms of who gets to participate and who's participating in the, in the dialogue. And I believe we do have a caller on the line with a question. Right. Uh, What's your name and where are you calling from? I don't know. Is it me? Yes, it is. Uh, Well, um, my name is Robin, and my question is, and it's not really a question, it's more of a comment, but television is such a wasteland of useless, commercial-driven garbage, 
And, I mean, honestly, well, I'm one of the 85,000 in Alameda County that doesn't mm-hmm. have digital. I'm not digital ready. And I'm not going to go out and get digital because I don't really want it anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have to tell you, as a media activist and an advocate who's been complaining and carrying on about the pitiful state of broadcast television for I don't know how many years, I kind of had, had the same reaction when this first came down the pike. People watch less television. It's a good thing. But the reality is that 67% of the U.S. population, according to the last census, gets the majority of their news and information about what's going on in the world from television, like it or not. Maybe they should, maybe they shouldn't, but that's how it happens. So to say that we don't care about that is really to say that a certain chunk of the population just doesn't matter, that they don't need the same access to information as the rest of us, and that their voices don't need to be heard in the public debate. And I think in reality, that's garbage, not just for their sake, but for ours, because if we're making decisions based on a small percentage of the population, then we're not hearing the voices and the perspectives in the public dialogue that we need. And one trip out to the blogosphere will show you that pretty clearly. It's certain voices talking and certain voices not talking. So that would be my answer to you. And I am privileged to have access to information. I'm media, I'm, I'm internet savvy and I have a TV at home with, actually I don't, I have a TV at home without cable and without an antenna. So basically I get one channel. And that's. And I don't want TV, but some people like my grandma really depend on watching Judge Judy to, you know, Pass the time in the day and to get information. It's so part for of many, way, it is yeah. their only source of information. It's a way that people connect and plug into society. So again, if you have a question for uh, Tracy Rosenberg, who's joining us from Media Alliance about digital TV transition transfer, you can call us at five one zero eight four eight four four two five. That's five one zero eight four eight four four two five. And we're going to take a quick music break. We'll be right back after this. Here on Full Circle, KPFA 94.1 FM, bringing you some nucleus with computer age. Push the button. That's what we're doing here at KPFA. And if you're just tuning in, we're speaking with Tracy, Tracy Rosenberg about the digital TV transition that's coming up in June. She's the executive director at Media Alliance. And break it down for folks who don't know what they need to do for the switch. Well, there's a couple of things that, that people can do. I mean, basically, there's there's three options if you have a analog television. You can run out. You can go buy a brand-new television manufactured in the last two years. That solves your problem. You can subscribe to Comcast. You can subscribe to Dish. You can subscribe to DirecTV. You'll have anywhere from 50 to 500 channels, for better or worse, and you'll pay a fee between $15 a month and 50 bucks a month or maybe more. Uh, the third thing that you can do if you don't want to do either of those two things, and I think it's important to realize that not everybody these days can afford to do either of those two things, then you can go through the converter box process, which means you have to get a coupon, you have to go to the store, you have to buy a, a converter box, and you have to hook it up to your television. Um, there are some assistance centers on the ground, thank God, in the Bay Area. Let me tell people where they are, and they can help you through 
kind of through this process, which is a little screwed up because, as we said, the government is about three million coupons or so behind. Um, in Oakland, there's a center at 1431 23rd Avenue. It's the corner of 23rd and International. It's open Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays from 11 to 5. The phone number is 513-533-7266. And the 510, folks, 510-510-5533-7266. And the folks there can help you out. That's the one that we're coordinating. In San Francisco, you can check out Self-Help for the Elderly at 407 Sansom Street as well. And we do have some callers on the line. Let's go to Mary Ann. You're on uh, Full Circle. Question for Tracy? Oh, hi. Hi, this is Mary Ann. Um, I'm in San Francisco. Hi, Tracy. It's Mary Ann Grubb. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, I, um, I'm one of those uh, people from the Vatadier Club. <laughs> um, and uh, I just I applied for a, a converter box um, coupon in January and January 30th, and I just got my coupon in the mail today. All right. So they are making progress slowly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I kept checking back uh, um, time and time again, and finally today uh, I was shocked actually, mm-hmm. that it came. Um and I have a flyer from Radio Shack. I know there was a demonstration in front of uh, pushing them to have a better price. Mm-hmm. I'm glad that you asked about that, yeah. And um, I have a flyer from, um, it says price is good um, January 25th to 31st. But um, And they were selling them for fourteen ninety nine after the coupon. Mm-hmm. Um, I was wondering if... I, I I could probably call them, but do you know offhand if they are still extending that? Yeah, actually they they aren't, Marianne. But I'm really glad that you asked about that because one of the um, important things to understand is that when this program was originally this transition was originally envisioned, the idea was that the forty dollar coupon would make the transition free because let's face it, the people that are benefiting from this primarily are the broadcasters who in the space where they used to play one channel can now play two or three or four channels and if you do the math, that's two or three or four times the advertising revenue and a whole bunch of people, many of them elderly, disabled and low income, have to run around and order coupons and buy boxes and hook and hook them up for benefits that for them may not be so significant. Um, so as it turned out, that $40 coupon for your free box hasn't turned out to be free. Most boxes are running 50 bucks, 60 bucks, 70 bucks. So there's an extra fee. You may need to rejigger your antenna. There's an extra 20, 25 dollars. So it's taking a toll. And this is a time when people really don't have extra money. So the Media Action Grassroots Network, which is sort of a coalition of grassroots media organizations around the country, is really trying to put some pressure on retailers to make a no-cost box, a free transition. It's bad enough we have to do all this hassle. We shouldn't have to dig out of our pocket for this switch. And Radio Shack is one of the retailers that we're trying to talk to to say, you need to get a box and you need to sell it for $40 and stop picking the cream off of this, what is really a mandatory transition for pe- for folks. They don't have any choice. So they shouldn't be making money off off of it. The government has allocated all of this money to try to pick up the cost, Mm -hmm. you know, creaming off an extra 10 or 20 bucks just because they can, just because people have to switch. Well, it's not what we think is the epitome of corporate responsibility. So I have high hopes that at some time before June that perhaps we'll be able to find a retailer in the Bay Area that will sort of take up that challenge and make a no-cost box available. But the answer is not quite yet. And how can people put, um, how can folks put pressure on those companies to offer a no cost, low cost box? Mm-hmm. We're planning to target a couple of retailers back in April with a very strong request. I think the date will be April 17th. Um, maybe Radio Shack, maybe another retailer, depending. Watch out, retailers. <laughs> and so we'll make some announcements on KPFA okay. in and in some other places when people can write, send emails, or possibly show up at a little rally in front of one store or another. So let's go to another caller. I'm not sure who. You're on Full Circle. Hi. Yes. Hi. Uh, I have a, a TV from the 70s, and oh, when wow. I went to get a box, they said, oh, well, it won't fit that TV that has two uh, screws that have the uh, 
you know, it's not the one single um, port to enter. Is that correct? That's correct. That said, there are 50 different brands of converter boxes, which is not entirely helpful. And there are several that will work with your television. The question is whether the particular retailer has in stock a converter box that will work with your uh, television. Okay, and one last question. The uh, coupon that I got uh, says it expires March 1st or something. Uh-oh. Does, does that mean that it actually does, or with the, with the extension, it wouldn't? One of the silly things about this program, there's actually quite a few, but one of them is the 90-day expiration date on the coupons. No one is quite sure why it's... Oh, yeah, that's very clever. ...why it goes that way, and it has created a huge problem with expired coupons. The answer is that your coupon, if it expired March 1st, is worth nothing. Not a... It's garbage. Throw it away. I think I'll I'll, I'll stick to KPFA and... Forget about TV. All right, thanks a lot. Okay, take care. And one other thing that I wanted to put out is if any of you ordered coupons then decided you're going cable or you're buying a brand new television, if your coupons haven't expired, we can use them at the Assistance Center in Oakland and donate them to folks that are in need. So I'd encourage people to mail them to us at 1431 23rd Avenue. Again, that's only if they haven't quite expired yet. So we're wrapping up here. Can you give folks um, one more time the information on how to get in touch with more information about the DTV transition and also the Assistance Center? Mm -hmm. There are actually three, well, actually four Assistance Centers in the Bay Area, so let me give all of that information. In San Francisco, Self-Help for the Elderly has a center at 407 Sansom Street. I don't have the phone number, unfortunately, but you can certainly reach them. There's also one at the Southeast Asian Community Center at 785 O'Farrell Street. Um, In Fremont and the South Bay, the Indian Cultural Center is providing DTV assistance services. And in Oakland and the East Bay, we have one sited at the San Antonio Neighborhood Network at 1431 23rd Avenue at International. And the phone number is 510-533-7266. So I want to thank you, Tracy Rosenberg, for joining us tonight. You're the executive director at Media Alliance. And to get in touch with Media Alliance, you can go to their website at www.media-alliance.org or give them a call at 510-832-9000. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. And we're going to take a quick music break with some Eric B. and Rakim. We'll be right back. This is a journey into sound. is a journey into sound. A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new value. When all is ready, I throw this switch. Pump up the volume, pump up the volume. Pump up the volume.
This ain't nothing but sweat inside my hands. So I dig into my pocket, all my money spent. So I just deep up, still coming up with less. So I start my mission, leave my residence, thinking how could I get some dead presidents? I need money. I used to be a stick up kid, so I think of all the devious things I did. I used to roll up, roll up, roll up, I used to roll up, roll up, I used to roll up. This is a hole up. Ain't nothing funny. That's Eric B and Rakim. Sorry, we gotta fade it. We're running out of time, but you know what? That song's called Paid in Full. Great song. You're tuned to KPFA 94.1 FM, and this is Full Circle. And that's radio produced by members of the First Voice Media Action Program. And I am your host, Renee D. I'm a graduate of First Voice and also the co-director of the program. And much of the focus of our program is to give folks the tools they need, the multimedia and social tools they need to tell their own stories and those from their communities. And that's what we're going to talk about right now with our guest, Rennie Young, who is doing that with folks from the East Oakland community. She is a public artist, and her work combines visual imagery with text to explore issues of culture and identity. And she's the director of Our Oakland Eastside Stories, and that's an integrated public art project come, coming out of East Oakland. They're, they're building a new library out there, and it's combining digital media with art. I want to thank you for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks. Yeah, right Thanks for having me. Mike. So the site for our Oakland East Side Stories is at the new Oakland Public Library, which is currently being built, and that's um, out at 81st Avenue in Rudsdale in East Oakland, and it's next to the Acorn Woodland School campus. Just talk about the new library and your role of integrating public art around the themes of mutuality and transformation. Sure. Um, the project is actually uh, part of a public art commission by the public art program of the city of Oakland for the new East Oakland Community Library. And this library is very exciting. It's the city of Oakland's first new branch library in 10 years. It's the city's first green public building. Uh, it's a 20,000 square foot building that is going to be shared by the two small schools that are co-located with it, uh, Acorn Woodland Elementary and also Encompass Academy, two wonderful schools with exemplary um, principals and just a fabulous student body. And so I came up with the idea of having public art not just be inanimate objects that people look at and maybe touch, but also something that really actively engages the community, not only in enjoying it, but in making it. And uh, what better place than a public library to create an archive of community stories? When I first got the commission, I started researching it, and I um, the only things I found would be like these really negative things about East Oakland. And I know that regardless of how difficult things are, every community is populated by real human beings, and there must be a multitude of stories and depth and richness. And I felt that it was very important for this project to let those aspects of the community also become visible and heard. And in your artist statement, you say that your work is about being, memory, and place. Describe more how you integrate this into the work that you're doing in East Oakland. Well, certainly being is just a state of being human. And um, just the range of um, extraordinary stories that come out of our everyday lives. I mean, that's really what art is about. It's not, to me about the extraordinary things that only very rare individuals or very rare situations um, will allow happen. It, I'm interested in the stories that are inherent in our day-to-day -day lives from all kinds of people. So let's talk about this interactive website that you're building out and in integra integrating with the public library. You had a first digital storytelling day that took place in October, and you're going to have another one coming up on the weekend of the 28th. Um, describe this web portal and and how folks will be interacting with it. Sure. Um, one of the things also that um, I wanted to take public art further is have it become a catalyst for community um, creativity. And there are tons of creative groups in Oakland, in East Oakland, creating amazing content about their community. 
and everybody's kind of reinventing a little bit of the wheel. That's just sort of how um, the scarcity of resources force us to do so. And I feel like, again, with the um, context of public library and public art in the city of Oakland, my vision really is to create a larger partnership that would have these civic institutions. I mean, what more trustable civic institution do we have left in this country than the public library, right? Um, and to really have that become the framing for a coming together of community partners who can pool their resources to create a whole that is greater than the sum of the parts. And that includes uh, just this fabulous range of groups that we have met in the process of our being out in the community trying to talk to people and um, let people know about the project. So it's, it's as you mentioned, media portrays Deep East Oakland as a very dangerous place with a lot of drugs and a lot of violence. But as you said, um, there's there are real people who live there with real stories and folks who have been there for generations who can talk up, speak about the history and have hope for the future. And it seems that this library is more than just a library that's going to be built in a community. It's it's engaging local people to participate in in the process of building more than just a library, but a community hub where oh, folks absolutely. can get together and, and actually build together for a better future for their grandkids. Absolutely. And I also want to not underplay the reality. The violence and the danger is real. Um, I don't want to put this gloss on things. Um, it's really to balance out the conversation so that there is also more a sense of pride and of hope, um, both from within the community and from outside for people to basically, information is power, knowledge is power. And what you said about you know, glossing things over, the more people hear bad things about themselves, the more they're going to keep perpetuating those stereotypes. So if there's a hope for, um, you know, the need of telling their own stories, that this is an important part of our society to hear their stories, I think that gives a sense of, of hope for folks to do better. You know, when they start hearing the history of, of the area, um, I think there's a healing property that can take place in, in a community to feel like they, they're important. I absolutely believe in that. I absolutely believe in that. And I think that that is one of the reasons that I do the work I do um, with community um, development to share the kind of vision that artists have struggled so hard to have the voice to be able to speak our truths. And that should be a right that every single human being has. That's the voice of Renee Young, who is talking about our Oakland East Side stories. And we're going to feature a digital story that was, um, that was given at the first digital storytelling day that took place in October. And that brought together over a dozen families from East Oakland to tell their, to tell their stories. Let's listen to that excerpt. <laughs> In the old days, I can remember as a child before Woodland was here, before this school was here, I attended Lockwood. And after this school was built, we were moved to this area because it was closer to our home. And it was great. I remember as a child um, coming to school and, you know, there was a lot of things in the neighborhood to do. I remember um, the streets always being filled with, with children, bikes. Skates, jump rope, hopscotch, that was going on. I mean, and we could play like to five or six in the evening until, you know, it got pretty late. And it's, it's different now. But there were skating rinks. I mean, right here in the area, we had skating rinks. I remember taking walks to a royal park. The, all five of us, right? The whole family. Yeah, royal park was great. They'd have plays, you know, stage plays. The puppet play. Puppets, huh? contests, all kind of things are always going in the neighborhood in the park. Mm -hmm. Another thing I remember about Oakland was um, in the area, like in the 73rd Avenue area, we didn't have to go all the way downtown. We didn't have to go all the way into another city. We had a lot of mm -hmm. stores. I mean, there was drug stores, the meat market, the cleaners, the library. Being a resident of Oakland, I've lived here, oh my goodness, I could say all my life because I, I was here before mm -hmm. starting beginning school. If we can't continue to see the possibilities for our city, you know, where where will it begin? Where will it start? Mm -hmm. And I'm 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 glad, you know, 
I don't have any intentions of moving, but I'd like to help. Yeah. But I'm excited about being here. I mean, we have to continue to thrive and to push our community forward because this is where our children are growing up and they're going to be adults one day and they're going to have to take their leadership. So our grandkids. Yeah. And so. So we have to have vision. Yeah. We have to have vision. Yeah. We're just excited as can be about the library. I mean, oh, oh my, my goodness. <laughs> my sister heard about this. She thought my knees are weak. <laughs> We, she loves books. We love books. I'm excited not only for us as adults, but to have a library in our community um, that's accessible, that's walk, in walking distance, that children mm-hmm. can, can study, you know, in the evenings or, you know, they have access to things that if they normally would not have access because sometimes kids are not able to always have their parents to take them mm-hmm. where they need to go. Having a library in our neighborhood where children can walk get excited about yeah, what's and, happening and get involved because, get involved, because yeah. there's a lot of things this is this will give them a place to be yes i can think of a better place for yeah. a library to be and i, I think that people having to, to fight for it yes and people coming out and people say we want we need this we want this speaking up for it and i know through that acorn community group that's how i found out they were coming around and tell me about the meetings i think people coming together and making their voice heard and the more people the better I was in an art contest at East Oakland Youth Development Center, <laughs> and I had, um, I don't know if you can see this, I kind of painted a picture of the things, what I love about Oakland, diversity, just the beauty of it, the different cultures and coming together, I think it's a gift, it's a wonderful gift, and a gift from God, and we should share it and you know, it's, it's beautiful. It's like a big bouquet. I always say it's like a big bouquet of flowers. If we can't see uh, the vision, we would like our communities to become, you know, then the, you can't see the hope or, or the possibilities. Well, we can get the community more involved, knowing, learning each other's names. So, oh, I know where so-and-so. She lives on 79, she lives on 78. Learning about their, you know, the kids. You yeah. know, that's my child. And that's, we, we can learn. That's what we used to have a long time yeah, ago. That's what make the difference. I'm happy that this is being done. This is a level of excitement, and, and you, it makes you feel like your hopeful. community cares. Yeah, yeah you there's hopeful. hope. There's something yeah. that's going to be done. Mm-hmm. You know, there's something that you can participate in, which is really nice. I wish I were an apple hanging on a tree. And every time the Cindy come by, she take a bite of me. Get along home, Cindy, Cindy. Get along home, Cindy, Cindy. Get along home, Cindy, Cindy. I'll marry you someday. That was Linda August and her sister Jennifer Herbie, Herbie talking about their hometown of East Oakland. And they talked about the history and hope of East Oakland, how excited they are to have a new library. And joining me is the project director and lead artist of our Oakland East Side Stories, Rennie Young. And um, talk about the timeline for the project up to the opening of the library. Well, we're very excited about the most immediate event happening, which is, is uh, just two weeks from today on March 28th, Saturday. It will be from 10.30 in the morning until 1 p.m. It's our second community storytelling day. And we want to be able to include people in this digital archive who don't have access to digital media. And so we have pulled together a fabulous partnership of community organizations. Um, First Voice, KPFA, and... um, Media Alliance are part of the production team. Uh, Youth Uprising in East Oakland, as well as Baycat, are all going to come together and run um, production stations where people can come and tell the stories, sing their songs, share their images. And we will also have activities provided by the um, nutritional Education Training Academy, NITA. Um, they will have educational information about healthy eating as well as some cooking, uh, little cooking ex- exercises. Uh, we will show some of the videos that we have collected from our October event. And we will also have a light refreshments, light lunch. This is all free. And we invite East Oakland participants to come, but you must pre-register. It's uh, space limited. So here's the phone number to call. 
510-350-7492. That's 510-350-7492. And you can ask for Mary Fuller. She'll sign you up for the event. And uh, it's starting to fill up. So uh, do get in touch with us. Yes, we want folks to come out so we have some some rich material to um, to record. And, and we love to hear folks tell their stories because it it enriches our lives as well um we can i think when we hear stories of others we can often relate to their own stories so it it bridges a lot of communities together and definitely people meet neighbors at these events and say hey i didn't know you live on the same street and that's part of the idea of having digital media be integrated with on the ground connectivity that just having people know each other online is only part of the process. We actually want people to say hello to each other over the back fence and across the street. So again, space is limited, but do call 510-350-7492 to register with Mary. And again, the event is March 28th. That's a Saturday from 10 to 1. And that's at Acorn? That's at Acorn Woodland on the corner of Rudsdale Avenue and 81st. So Acorn Woodland, and you are looking for some scholars, some folks who can support some scholarship funds to do production. Is that true? Absolutely. Uh, if people can help pitch in on stipends for the talented media producers intergenerational group, uh, we would absolutely appreciate it. And the website to both find out more about our Oakland Eastside stories, as well as to donate to this is at www.oaklandspeaks.weebly, that's W-E-E-B-L-Y dot com, oaklandspeaks.weebly dot com. So if you want to check, and is there a number folks can call? Is it the same number with Mary? Yeah. Okay, so again, for more information, oaklandspeaks.weebly.com or 510-350-7492. I want to thank you so much for joining us and talking to us about the dig- our Oakland digital stories, East Side stories. Thank you so much for the opportunity. So this is KPFA. We'll be right back after this music break. I'm still trying to find a way for peace, a way to reach the intangible that struggle on the streets. Is they hustle on the streets but never grow and return? Never learn from your mistakes until you get your turn to be a casualty. It's too late, death is all a spoken fate. Lack of faith in life perpetuates a growing murder rate. Can you follow me? The ghetto didn't swallow me. Got react finally, then it's easy to acknowledge me. That's what you want to see. The animal created in a lethargic state, broken and educated. Stereotypes of a young black male. We fell victim to the image that the TV sells. Hell, we got to eat too. We want to shine too. Get your money. Don't let the money consume you. Because it can doom you. What is your destiny? Think about your purpose on earth before you rest. But what you think about every day? Some real issues, some simple issues that keep us going away. We wanna die, or is it really that we wanna live? But we scared, so we pretend to not care and say we live life in the fast lane, cooking up that hard cane, chopping down trees, packing pistols just to maintain. My mind frame got insane when I caught the game, had to make a change, so my focus all remain the same. My heart is full of pain every time a brother dies. Another funeral, no wonder why I couldn't cry. It happens all the time where I besides, I hold my homicide, stressful flex to be alive. We ride until the day we die, duck and dodge in the fears, trying to make it to See 25, no time for the stop signs. Get it, cause I got mine on the front line. We are so behind as a people raised to be illegal when lethal, when equal condition with these people. Ways get paid, that's what we say of the consequence and who we murder in a way. But what you think about a day? Some real issues, simple issues that keep us going away. We want to die, or is it really that we want to live? But we scared, so we pretend to not care. Just for the simple fact that I'm a boss on the track and I really ain't touching me. Just for the way that I rock with the bass and the knock and that's why you all love me. Lyrics for yes indeed. You know we might make it look easy, but it ain't no cakewalk, baby. I'm here to tell you. Take your time and let it work itself out. Yeah. Don't let nobody. 
already shut you down. down. Sometimes I feel like the last hex stand. A lot of dudes quit, out of groups disbanded. That's why I can't take none of this for granted. Uh, still slapping and it's still no cap. Cause to this day I'm guilty of daydreaming. Cause I never stop pushing, never stop believing. But it wasn't always like that. My life was So we got a full house here on KPFA 94.1 FM, full circle. That was. Lyrics Born, and before that, you heard some Ice Life and G. Capone off Lyrics, um, not Lyrics Born, off Ice Life's uh, album, Prince Cometh. And he'll be performing at Soma Arts Cultural Center, 934 Brandon Street in San Francisco on Friday, March 20th. This event is hosted by Homie. Homie's organizing the mission to empower youth to bring attention to the education crisis facing our nation. And we have some folks here to talk about the event, Alejandra Mod. Mo- Mojica, Mojica, who is the youth coordinator at Homey. Thanks for coming through. And Jennifer, Karen, and Kevin, and Mireya. Mireya. nice to meet you all. Um, they're all here to talk about Homey. So why don't you, Jennifer, start off, or Karen, start off by talking about Homey. Well, Homey is an abbreviation for Homies Organizing the Mission to Empower Youth, and we're a community-based Nonprofit organization that works within the Mission District to address the violence that's been going on in our communities by making the youth conscious of their surroundings, both politically and environmentally. And we give them the tools and skills to, um, how do I put it, to organize and, you know, try to make a change within their society. And how did you get involved with Homie? Well, I was actually recruited by one very nice person, one of their young members, and I just fell in love with the program. Why do you like it? Because it's um, really, it's led by youth. It's a cooperative. It's not nobody, it's the youth and the adults are both equal, and we both have a say, and we organize our own, you know? We're not told what to do because we're being taught to be the leaders of tomorrow. Right. That's that's Karen talking to us about Homie. And Jennifer, you guys got a campaign going on. Give us some information about the campaign. Yeah, so we got a campaign right now going on. It's basically go- talking about the A3G requirements. So in San Francisco, we already have the A3G requirements passed. So now we're just trying to get them implemented the right way. Tell us about that. What, what do you mean? Like, instead of a youth being taught, like, straight out of a textbook, because you could implement the A through G and be taught straight out of the textbook, but now we're sitting down at the table and asking for ethnic studies, stuff that youth want to learn about it to keep them from dropping out, from cutting class, and, like, to keep youth from joining, because when youth are not being taught what they want in school, they're dropping out and ending up on the street, and this is a way for us to address the violence that's happening in our communities by stopping these youth from and helping them stay in school and also giving them a chance to succeed in college because right now they're not getting the chance to succeed in college because the school's district is denying them the chance and the ability to apply for a four-year university. And a lot of folks are dropping out because they just can't seem to apply themselves in school because it's not relating to their lives. So you guys are trying to get a find a way to get studies in that actually relate to folks, um, what the young people are facing today. Is that right? Yeah, that is correct. And how did you get involved with Homie? I got involved with Homie to um, one of my teachers that works now at June Jordan. Her name is Nancy Hernandez, and she brought me to Homie and brought me to this whole light of organizing and bringing attention to issues that are happening in my community and how to address them and how to bring back to my community in a positive way. And that's the voice of Jennifer, and we're talking about Homie. Also with us is Alejandra Mojica, and you are the youth coordinator. Um, talk about your work that you do at Homie with, with um, being the youth coordinator. So um, a lot of the, the work that I do is um, through outreach and through the meetings that we have. So I go around to different high schools along sometimes with um, some of our members. When we go do outreach where we run different kinds of educational workshops around issues that we feel are important that our students need to know about that's lacking in the education system but that we know are beneficial to our young people um, and as far as them being able to be 
to to play more active roles they need to know what what's going on so we do a lot of outreach workshops and um you know try to do events at schools and you just also just try to be present in different neighborhoods to be able to keep connections with the young people and we have meetings every tuesday at 4 30 at our office on ninth and mission and um that's basically those are our calpuli meetings and that's our our youth council group which these folks are part of and um we just run a t- series of different workshops around political education around indigenous culture around you know stuff that applies to our lives and our culture and um give and then train train our youth with the skills and tactics that they need to be able to actually make those changes and, and organize and get you know laws passed and people you know people that represent us and and so forth so that's what the bulk of I do. And you mentioned Kaupuli, which is, um, talk about the indigenous um, aspect of, of the youth um, coordination that you do, because I know you were, you've you done a lot of danza and um, also document like documentary films. So how does that all come together in your work? Um, well, being the homies, one of the, like one of the only, there's like maybe one other organization that really focuses or caters to the Latino, Raza, Chicano youth population. And so, um, along with that, like we really try to incorporate, you know, our, our cultura as a part of that. And so we definitely bring that, um, bring that culture into the group, you know, we, with, with the traditions that we use there, whether, you know, it's burning sage in our meetings and, and getting people to understand and incorporate that into their lives, you know, as a part of something that's in our traditions. And, um, we take, we take youth to different ceremonias so that they're a, a part of that too. And, um, you know, it's reflected also too in, in the artwork that we do with the shirts that we make. And, um, a lot of, um, a lot of our students, especially right now, have actually joined different danza groups and, um, and and have actually been a part of that. And we also try to elect young folks to, you know, be like Chilonen and Guatemala to, uh, that, that are like... Um, transition kind of like a quinceanera but in a in in a more traditional indigenous way and so we just incorporate that into everything that we do and and give that exposure to our young people to not forget where we come from that's the voice of alejandra mojica who is um here with homie and also with us is jennifer karen and kevin and kevin what do you think about the indigenous ceremonies have you gone to some and how is that um how's that for you yeah, I actually went to one in City College, and it, it was pretty cool. And uh, like the way they they like they like show the, themselves, you know. And like it was pretty, it was pretty like spiritual too. Would you like to stay in touch with that? Yeah, I would. And you guys have a event coming up on March twentieth. Uh, talk about this event and what what folks will be seeing. Yeah, we're going to have an event in March 20th. We're going to have, like, this kind of, like, concert we're going to throw out. And, uh, yeah, like, it's for, like, young folks that to, like, go there and have something to do with that night instead of going out to the streets and get trouble, you know? So it's an event to raise awareness about education. Yeah. And today is Pink Friday, and it's a deadline for school districts to issue preliminary pink slips the California's teachers. So uh, more than 26,500 teachers have received these notices, and you're all organizing this event to bring attention to the education crisis that the nation's facing. Seems like with the economy, more people are getting, are, are struggling. And then I, fo- I know folks who just haven't been impacted too much yet because they've already been struggling. So do you guys have any um, input on, on how it relates to the work that you're doing with Homie? Um, the way it is is that basically it is because we're trying to bring teachers to like not to we need more teachers in schools for small other classrooms for students to get that one on one time with the teacher because when you have a large population of students in a class that's those students that are struggling are not getting the attention so what we need is actually more teachers not teachers being laid off or cut off because always when there's a crisis in the education when there's a crisis in the economy they cut off from the schools immediately why don't they cut from the prison industrial system they don't cut from that they don't cut from the police that are actually increasing their their yearly salary every year which you know it would make more sense to cut off of them than the education which is already a struggling 
pro problem in the community. And also, too, the reality right now is that we have a really amazing opportunity to be at the table with with other teachers, with principals, with other community leaders. And the superintendent of San Francisco right now has really um, been shedding light on on the achievement gap. He wants to address the achievement gap and, and has even, you know, um, been on board with recognizing that there's still racism, you know, within, I mean, within our society, but also within our education system and the way students are disciplined and isolated and the, the support that or lack of support um, you know that there's still racism relevant in that and so he's he is um, you know um, putting together study teams right now and there's also the organization WIMAC that's been doing a lot of work around the A through G and so we're all in this fight together right now and we just have this really amazing opportunity to be at the table right now and make the changes that we want to see in our education system which has been a long fight you know that goes all the way back to the 60s when in the civil rights and Chicano movement when people were trying to fight for college access and equitable education and trying to fight for teachers that look like us and the curriculum that we were learning and so now we have this opportunity to be at the table and we're getting young people's opinions and we want to get more youth voice there and make sure that our stories are being told and addressed because you know along with gentrification like so many people that are in positions making decisions right now are not reflective of the culture in frisco are not reflective of our folks don't look like us don't understand our stories and our struggles and so we're at the table making sure that our needs are addressed with, within this education system but you know what the 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 link to the to the budget is that if we want to increase support services if we want to have more teachers if we want to have technology programs you know and whatever other things that that we're looking for if we want to transform the textbooks all that takes money and so that the the education fight and the budget fight are not separate they go hand in hand and you know if we're going to fight for education we're also going to be fighting that more money be put into that because that is at the root cause of a lot of issues that we see you know sp particularly amongst violence that we have you know poor education system that's not catering to the needs of, of the folks that are a part of it. So we are running out of time here. We want to make sure folks get the information on the event. And um, hold on. So the event's coming up on March 20th, and that's from 7 to 11 p.m. at Soma Arts. And do you want to give out some more information on this event? Yeah, the, the event is called Education or the Bullet. That stands for like get educated, you know, don't be out in the streets. And the cost is uh, ten dollars general admission, and five dollars with student ID card. And nobody would be turned away, and no red or blue allowed. And can you give us more, like, describe um, the event and who's going to be there? Okay, so really quick, um, we have a lot going on that night. Um, the main thing that we're doing is trying to raise money to start our own scholarship fund. We're pushing and advocating for college access, equal college access. And um, so home is all about, you know, self-determination so we took it into our own hands if we're going to push people to go to college well what happens when you get there so we want to start our own scholarship fund that we can give out money for um, for folks who make it to college it's March 20th it's from 6 to 11 we have freestyle rap and dance battles in the beginning of the night where you can win cash prizes that's what I want to go to um, there'll be live mural art it's all ages so there'll be a kids corner for little kids you can bring aunties uncles and grandmas too um, there'll be vendors raffle prizes and and um, we got Brown Buffalo, Ice Life, Hairdo, Ducey Clips, See What Said, Do That, Sierra Sean, Power Struggle, and DJ All Night. And um, yeah, it'll be at, at Soul Mars in San Francisco. And if folks want to get in touch with Homie, um, if if you want to get in touch with Homie, how do you want to? Uh, you can visit our website, homeysf, H O M E Y S F dot org. If um, you can't make it to the concert but you want to plug in or be able to help out in some way, we do have a donate now button on our web page um, where people can donate money um, just to support the programs to continue running. You know, we've been hit real hard with the budget cuts and um, we're definitely feeling it across the board. But the work keeps going, so if folks want to support, going. yeah, please. Come thank listen. you all for coming through tonight. Yeah. All right, thank, thank you. you for so hopefully folks will check out that event coming up and also coming up at Oakland City Hall on Monday, March 16th at 5 p.m. It's called Yes, We Can Jail These Pigs. It's a follow-up from the Oscar Grant shooting. So 5 o'clock 
on Monday, March 16th, be there at Oakland City Hall. They're going to bring justice to um, to Oscar Grant. So for more information, you can go to justiceforoscargrant at gmail.com. Also tonight is Pecha Kucha for International Women's Month. Pecha Kucha Night in Oakland at Eastside Arts Alliance 2277 International in Oakland. And I want to thank you all for joining us tonight on Full Circle. Check out our archives and our website at firstvoicemap.org. Special thanks.